Come on. <laughs> Climb on. <laughs> okay, the course uh, MET 6208 is for uh, thermodynamics of solutions. It's a theoretical course. I know that you're here because you want to learn how to do optimizations and things. I'm not going to teach you how to do optimizations. I'm not going to say this is how you put a cube term in your equation. This is where you put the square term. That's you learn that yourself from doing your, uh, your thesis work. This is the background. This is the theoretical background to it. What model should I use? What model should I not use? Why am I doing this? How do I understand whether these data from this source are better than the data from this source? And this requires a fundamental understanding of thermodynamics, classical phenomenological thermodynamics, uh, and it also requires the solution modeling. By a model here, what we mean is relating the thermodynamic properties to the molecular structure of the solution. If you, uh, you could fit a Gibbs energy of your solution to a totally empirical equation over a given composition and temperature range, and as long as you have enough terms, of course, you can fit it, you can fit anything. But that's rather useless because you cannot interpolate, you cannot extrapolate, you cannot predict anything. It's just an empirical equation. The equation must be based upon uh, the, proper, uh, the, un the proper equation, so that uh, based upon the physics and chemistry of the situation, so that you can extrapolate the thing. So if you fit even one component fist system, if you fit a heat capacity as a function of temperature to any kind of equation, then it fits over that temperature range and not five degrees beyond. You have to fit it to an equation that has some basis in physical in physics. Physics will tell you the heat capacity should be A plus BT plus CT to the minus two based upon the theory of harmonic oscillators, and that can be extrapolated. This is a similar thing if you're trying to fit an equation of the Gibbs energy of a solution as a function of composition and temperature, you have to have an equation that represents the Gibbs energy in terms of the, uh, well, in terms of the structure of the solution, the entropy, how the atoms and ions are distributed on the lattices, and in terms of the energy of the bonds and the short range ordering and so on. Then you will have a small number of empirical terms you will be able to extrapolate, and also you will be able to use the model to uh, predict, um, to predict properties, say, of ternary systems from binary systems because it's based upon a proper physical model. So you're making, when you're interpolating, you know, what you're doing and all this stuff is you're saying, when you're doing the optimizing, you're optimizing a binary system, and then you're trying to predict the turn or the properties of the ternary system from your binary parameters. Clearly, this is not a mathematical exercise. This is a physical exercise. The equations you use to go from the binary to the ternary must be based upon some physical chemical understanding. So this is what this is about, the uh, structure of solutions, metals with short long-range order, defects, uh, ionic solutions, molten salts, molten oxides, etc. What is the difference? What kind of what is the difference in the similarities? How do we describe the thermodynamic properties as a function of the distribution of the atoms on the lattices in terms of the bond energies, which become the uh, which become the parameters of the model, and so on? This is also essential to really understand the fundamental thermodynamics if you're going to do uh, evaluation of experimental data, because you have to be able to evaluate the experiments. You have to know if two experiments disagree with each other, why they disagree, and whether the values that the people have are reasonable or not reasonable. Uh, to be able to evaluate error limits. If you say we fitted the heat of mixing to within five joules, I will say that's nonsense. Nobody can measure it that well. Uh, is this a reasonable looking function given that this is this type of a solution? Okay, if you're trying to mix calcium oxide and silica and you mix them and then your result looks kind of like an ideal solution, I'll tell you that's nonsense. Everybody, you should know that it's going to be very, very negative deviation. This is the sort of thing, a feeling for the solution modeling, the fundamental theory of where, what it's all about. So this is what this course is designed for. Now, you've all, according to Inho, had a very good ba backing background in ther fundamental thermodynamics and you all understand thermodynamics and you know what chemical potentials are, but probably you don't because nobody really does, even though you may think you do. So I always start this course with a, about a three-week review of fundamental thermodynamics. Now, it's a review. I'm doing this quickly, uh, not teaching you from the beginning, but we're reviewing the most fundamental concepts of thermodynamics fairly rigorously, but quickly, not with a whole lot of examples. So this is where you can ask questions and let me know if you understand it, because it really is essential if you don't really understand what chemical potential is, you're going to run into trouble later. If you don't really understand the phase rule, you will run into trouble if you're trying to do anything later. So we really have to get the fundamental concepts before we get into the 
into the solution theory. Now, okay. Um, on the website, and for future generations, this is the FactSage website. Click on CRCT, student section, course MET 6208, and these are all the downloads that you see. Okay, now you can do this however you want. I'll be using mainly these downloads during the course. I'll show them here when we go in. I'll be using that as the course notes. I will also be writing on the board. So do it any way you want. I, being of the old school, would print out some pages and maybe write on them while I was talking, but do it however you want. But please download them all. The major ones here are, the order is simply because number 42, for the next three weeks or so, we'll be uh, doing, looking a lot at this one, because this is the review which I just wrote. This is a chapter in the uh, book, Physical Metallurgy, Elsevier. Volume 5, which hasn't come out yet. Okay, but I was asked to write this chapter on thermodynamics and phase diagrams. This chapter is, uh, again, it's aimed at graduate level and uh, researchers in the field. Uh, it's mainly about phase diagrams, but the beginning is the uh, review of thermodynamics. Uh, more or less, that's necessary to understand phase diagrams, but that's sort of what you're doing. So I'll be using this quite a bit as a text. So, um, what else is in here is this one, homework problems. Okay, first of all, they're in French. Okay, these are the um, homework problems. Okay, this is for the first three weeks or so of this course. This, this homework problems is a book which we used to print out, which is now online, uh, which I used to use when I gave my undergraduate thermodynamics course at Polytechnique for. 30 years. Uh, okay, so these are not, these, this is the review of fundamental thermodynamics for metallurgy and materials engineers. These are practical questions. Okay, starting at the very beginning for first course, for first two courses in thermodynamics. Okay, so this doesn't touch, <coughs> hardly any problems in here touch upon solution theory. A couple do, but mainly it's basic thermodynamics. Okay, so these are the homework problems that I used to hand out to all the undergraduate students. Okay, now what I intend to do in this course is not, I'm not going to hand these out to you and go through them all, but each week I will, we're going to talk about it, each week I will give you maybe 15 or 20 questions from here and say look at these. Uh, it's also a chance to learn some French if you don't speak French or to get one of your bilingual friends to translate it for you. Okay, now, um, what I intend to do here, I say homework, I'm not, I don't, I'm going to correct your homework, okay, you don't have to do all the problems, I don't think that if you have the background in thermodynamics that I hope you have, that you will need to do all the problems, but I would encourage you to look at the problems and be sure you understand how to do it, because if you don't understand how to do it, then you should try to do it and ask me in the next course how to do it. So these are simple questions, I mean, well, okay, this is the simplest, uh, chapter one, but the problems, by the way, are, are in chapters with Roman numerals, this is per, uh, ideal gases, first law of thermodynamics. So when I'm giving out these problems for homework, this will be problem, for example, the second problem is 1-2. Okay. All right, so question one is the density of ammonium is measured way by weighing the gas in a big bottle at half an atmosphere and zero Celsius. This is the, uh, the density, calculate the molecular mass of ammonia, and what are your assumptions? Clearly, well, let's say an ideal gas law, and you should know how to do that. I don't have to, you don't have to type in all the numbers and everything, but uh, be sure you understand it. And sometimes, maybe it's worthwhile to write it out a little bit, because, oh, that sounds simple, but when, when you actually start to do the problem, you find that it wasn't quite as simple as you thought. Okay, so at least read it over. Try to write out the equations. You don't have to go and type in all the numbers if you don't want to. But if you really find you don't understand it, then think about it. Now. What I intend to do, okay, we'll just give you another ideas of the sort of things that are in here. Uh, the sort of things that I expect that you would be able to do. Um, okay, uh, bomb calorimeter. The uh, internal energy of this reaction has been measured in a bomb calorimeter for that reaction. You should know how a bomb calorimeter works. Calculate the heat, the delta H of the reaction. Okay. 
Uh, difference between a real gas and a perfect gas. Calculate the work of expansion assuming a real gas. Uh, calculate the work of, work of expansion assuming that it's a uh, van der Waals gas. Uh, second chapter is things like uh, enthalpy and uh, enthalpy and heat balances. Simple calculate the heat required to heat one mole of lead from 298 to 1300 Kelvin at top constant pressure given the heat capacities and the heat effusion. Okay, if you know right off how to do it, skip it. If you don't know how, think, of, think a little bit about it. And the questions, of course, get more complicated as we go on. We get into chemical equilibrium, activity, equilibrium constants, uh, things like that. But I mean, this is fundamental thermodynamics. So each week, what I plan to do probably is on Thursdays, because Thursdays you have five days till the following Tuesday, I will give you a lot of problems. Uh, this is maybe for the first three weeks or so until we're finished with the fundamental review which you should look at, go over, do if you think are necessary, and then the following Tuesday I will put the problems on the board and say does anybody have a problem with this one, want to discuss it, if you all say no then I won't discuss it, I'll go on to the next one, if anybody has a question we will. I find that usually that will take maybe half an hour at the beginning of the course to clear up some difficulties and most people have, rarely does one person have a problem, usually everybody has the same problem. But, uh, Okay, so this is, I think this is important, and frankly the first quiz, the first exam, will have a lot of questions of this nature to be sure that you have actually done the work and understand it. Um, so if you have a really good background, you don't need to do it at all. If you don't have a good background, but you've had some, then you can work like hell for the next three weeks, and you can probably get yourself up to uh, scratch. Okay. Now there are answers to this. And I'm going to ask you a question now. I have down here homework answers. You don't have that, however, on the website. Now, I can put that up on the website. Homework answers are work solutions. They're not just numbers. I mean, this is the homework answers you that actually has. There's, there's your equation for the I. This is number one, the density of an ideal gas. And the, that's how you do it. Okay, so I can. It's two ways of doing this. Um, each week I can give you a certain number of problems and then say Monday, on Thursday, then say Monday morning I will put the answers for those problems on the website and I'll cumulatively add them to this homework answers. That's what I did last year. So you can play with it yourself for four days and then the last day if you want you can look up the homework answers and see where you went wrong. That should then save time in the course because then you'll see you can, I'm on draw, I get it now. Only when, even with the answers, you don't understand it, will you have to ask me questions. And of course, okay, but at least that gives you a time of four days or so where you're not tempted just to go to the answer. Now, if you feel that is babying you, then I can just put all the answers on now, and then you can um, you can look at them as you wish. But I mean. It, it really is not to your advantage to just, you know, look at the problem and quick go to the, think. If you look at the answer now, now I know how to do it. I don't have to, because then you don't think about it. You just go to the answer. You think, you think you've learned it, but you only learn things by thinking about them yourself. So I would recommend that I don't do that. I do what I said, that I put them on every Monday. But if you think, uh, what do you think? I do think. You agree? Well, you'll have a day and a half that way. So play with them over the weekend. <coughs> anyway, if you really feel that the way you want to do it is just look at the question and look at the answer, you'll have lots of time Monday and Tuesday to do that, okay, or afterwards. They'll be there then for the rest of the year, so it'll give you a little while to think. I really recommend, though, that don't turn to the answer too quickly, because you fool yourself into thinking you understand it, but you really only understand things when you've thought about them yourself, not when you've just read it. And when it comes to the first exam, I won't give you the answer, so you'll have to do it. So that's what I intend to do. If, say, noon on Monday, I haven't yet done that, please somebody send me an email and say, put up the answers, please. So, mm -hmm. Okay. All right. Um, the final exam will probably be the course ends on December, well, trimester ends on December 5th. Probably the last week of November I won't be here at all. <coughs> But I know some of you are going, was it you that told me? Some of you, you know, kind of want to leave on December 5th or 6th, I can try to have, we'll try to have the final exam before people have to, uh, to go away. So I mean the exam period goes right up till the 20th of December, but we'll try to have it so that if you want to 
get out of here, you can get out of here by the time the course is over. So I don't know what the actual dates for the first two exams are yet, but the first one will be about five weeks from now. Uh, I do not intend to respect McGill's study week. Um, does anybody have a problem with that? Are there any questions about this, the, the structure of the course and what we're trying to do? Okay, I'll give you, well, I intend, of course, I say this, nobody does it, but each week I'll give you reading. This is the stuff you should read for next week so that we can have a nice discussion. If it doesn't work that way, I mean, you'll, but you should, whenever I ask, tell you to read something, do it. Prepare for the next week. Okay. Um, okay, well, if you have any questions about the structure, we'll start talking about thermodynamics. So I'm going to go to this, what I said, the uh, physical metallurgy chapter number 42. Most of these other ones are in the order that I'm going to use them in the course, except that I just did this this summer, so that's why it's at the end. Okay, this should be published around the end of the year. Okay, now what's the best way to do this? I don't want to make it... I guess that's all I have to do. I make it smaller, it goes smaller on the screen too, right? Mm -hmm. Okay, well let's skip the introduction. Okay, you can read the introduction if you want. Um, thermodynamics, it's intended to provide a review of the fundamentals of thermodynamics, the first and second law of thermodynamics. Okay, I'm starting at the beginning. Uh, and please, you're supposed to ask questions and don't hesitate to ask questions. You don't have to identify yourself for the camera, and she won't turn the camera to your face. All right, the, you're talking about a thermodynamic system. A thermodynamic system is whatever we want to define as the system, the most convenient thing. The rest of the world, so here you have the system, and then everything else outside that is called the surroundings. So you have the system, and you have the surroundings. The definition of the system is usually pretty evident, but it's convenient. You define it as you wish. Uh, if the thermodynamic system, now during a process things go on in the system, a chemical reaction might go on in the system, so the system could have an initial state which is carbon plus oxygen and it goes to a final state of the system which is carbon dioxide, so we talk about a change of state of the system, something's going on in the system. Generally we define the surroundings, almost always you define the surroundings so that nothing happens in the surroundings except it's a heat sink or source. Heat and work are exchanged, but there's no process is going on in the surroundings. The process you're considering, the reaction is going on in the system. This is usually pretty straightforward. And the system can exchange heat and work with the surroundings. And mass. So if a system is permitted to exchange both energy and mass with its surroundings, and it's an open system, these are just definition. If energy but not mass be exchanged, the system is closed. Usually we define systems as closed, it's easier to work with them, that is, you can exchange energy but the mass of the system remains constant, but sometimes we have to talk about mass crossing the boundary between system and surroundings as well. Um, the state of a system, now the, the state of a system, <coughs> okay, you can talk about non-equilibrium states, the system has temperature gradients in it and so on, but we generally try to talk about equilibrium states. The system has a certain internal equilibrium, no temperature gradients, and so on. But the state, not necessarily though, a state can be any state. The state of a system is defined by two types of properties, intensive properties like temperature and pressure, and these are independent of the mass of the system. I can have one gram of copper or a kilogram of copper, and I still can be at the same temperature and pressure. So these intensive properties are, we'll talk a lot more about them. Okay, but I think this is evident, which are independent of the mass and by extensive properties like the volume and the internal energy. And all these vary directly as the mass of the system. So if you have a system, everything else is the same and you double its mass, you have twice the internal energy, you have twice the volume. Okay, so extensive properties vary directly as the mass of the system. Uh, the nomenclature that I'm going to use that is somewhat unique to this course and the papers that I write, but not the authorities even then, but I find it's a useful way of doing it, but don't think that everybody does it this way. As extensive properties that depend on the mass are represented by uppercase majuscule symbols. For G is the Gibbs energy in joule, G uppercase. So 
You have two grams of copper, you'll have twice as much Gibbs energy as one gram of copper. Molar properties, we often talk about a molar property, so we say the Gibbs energy G has units of joules. Okay, then you take the molar Gibbs energy G, which is equal to G over the number of moles in the system, and that has units of joules per mole, and that's a molar property. And to distinguish between them, I use a lowercase letter for molar properties. Okay, now usually in the literature, however, you don't find this. People use the uppercase for both, and this can be somewhat confusing. They will, if you see a big G, it usually will mean molar Gibbs energy. I try to be precise and make it the lowercase, okay? This is what I'm going to do. So, and I use, I use also the notation, I mean, people use number of moles will be a capital N, a small n, something. I use a small n always as the number of moles, okay, where n is the total number of moles in the system. I use a small n for moles, I use a small m for mass, and I use a capital N generally to indicate the number of atoms when we're doing a <coughs> statistical derivation of the entropy, n is the number of atoms in the system. N for mole fractions. Uh, some people will use N for mole fractions. This can be confusing. N to me is the number of atoms. X is the mole fraction, or sometimes you might find a small x. Or this doesn't really matter, but upper or lowercase x will be the mole fraction. N is the number of atoms. M is the mass. N is the number of moles. Uh, N copper is the number of moles of copper. So, okay, so that's sort of the notation that I'm going to use. Um, okay, the first law of thermodynamics. The internal energy of a system is U, is the total thermal and chemical bond energy in the system, and it's an extensive property. So you have a system in a certain state. The state is defined by the temperature, the pressure, the number of moles, whatever's in the system, and it will have a certain amount of energy in it. Now the internal energy is loosely the total energy, chemical energy, which can be bond energy and it can be thermal energy of motion. Now a system in general, uh, can have more than just internal energy. The whole system could be, I don't know, an automobile which is moving along the road, so it has kinetic energy. Or if you're dealing with you know, water in a pipe or fluid in a pipe in a chemical engineering plant, then you'd have gravitational potential head. And that would then be uh, the general notation for that is that's the total energy of the system, which would be U plus other energies. But in this, in this course, we're dealing with chemistry. We're only dealing with the internal energy. We're not dealing with anything else. Things are not moving. They're not going up and down. Okay. So we'll be dealing with the internal energy. Now, there is no obvious zero, absolute zero for internal energy. Okay, The internal energy is, you can't actually say the internal energy of a system is 103 joules. It's very difficult to define what you mean by your zero point energy, but it doesn't matter because the only thing we care about in this course is changes of a system. So we'll have a system, let's say the system in its initial state uh, consists of a mole of carbon and a mole of oxygen at P is 1 bar and uh, T is 298 Kelvin and that goes to, if that's say U initial, U1 and then the system changes energy to form one mole of CO2 at P is 1 and T is 298 and that has a U2, and we talk about delta U, which is the energy of the final state minus the energy of the initial state. Clearly, U is a state property. It's a property of the system. When a system's in the state, it has a certain internal energy. So the change in internal energy is independent of any details of the path. I can go, I had the same two temperatures here, initial and final. So I could actually, the process could occur at constant temperature or the, during the process, say this system could be heated to 1,000 degrees and then cooled back down to here. Okay, so the path is completely uh, irrelevant. The delta U, once you get back here, is U2 minus U1. To calculate delta U of any state property, you only need to know the final and the initial. You need to know nothing about what goes on in between. This can, seems evident, but you can forget it. Now, uh, we're going to consider a by the way, the, stand, the temperature of reference, not standard state, but the reference temperature that's usual in thermodynamics is 298.15 Kelvin. Okay, but we generally write 298, but we mean 298.15. Okay. Also, in terms of pressure, uh, well, for most practical purposes, the difference between a bar and which is 100,000 Pascal. 
and uh, 10 to the fifth pascals in one atmosphere is very small, but it can make a slight difference. You're supposed to use a one bar standard state back there. Uh, okay, but this is really only important if you're dealing with things at near room temperature where you have really accurate stuff, the sort of stuff we're dealing with, plus or minus a joule or five joules, it really doesn't make that much difference. Okay, now when a system goes from an initial state to a final state, if the internal energy changes, uh, we're talking about a closed system, if the internal energy changes, then there has to be some transfer of energy between the system and surroundings. Okay, because you have conservation of energy. So, consider a closed system undergoing a change of state involving an exchange of heat and work with the surroundings. So there's an exchange of heat for which we use Q, and there's an exchange of work for which we use the symbol DW, and these are energies that cross the boundary between the systems and surroundings, and by the um, conservation of energy, the change in internal energy is equal to the energy, that, the energy, the change in the energy in the system is equal to the energy that has crossed the boundary between the system and the surroundings. Okay, I probably drew this backwards. Uh, I should have drawn the arrows this way because the convention is that heat, heat and work that are added to the system are positive. Okay, so if the heat and work are added to the system, the internal energy goes up. Uh, there used to be, if you read some old literature, there used to be an old convention that work was positive being done by the system, but this is the modern convention. Okay, so the, uh, this is the way you write the first law. Now it used to be minus dW. Okay, this is called the first law of thermodynamics. The first law of thermodynamics is the uh, um, conservation of energy. But there's also more to the first law than that. The first law also states that there's a fundamental difference between heat and work. Okay, whereas work, as you know then, is directed energy, a vector quantity. Force times distance, and the distance is a vectorial quantity. If you're got a piston lifting up a weight, that's work. Uh, you could also have electrical work. And a battery is running, it's transforming electrical work with the surroundings, because that is actually a directed, the current is flowing in one direction, and work is being done by the system. Okay, so you can have different kinds of work, pressure, volume, expansion work, you can have electrical work, and so on. Uh, heat is disordered energy, it's the energy of random motion of the molecules. Okay, it's a fundamentally different thing. And in thermodynamics, we know that work always ends up degrading into heat, which is really what the second law of thermodynamics is about, because heat is much more random than, than the work. Okay, you can't, you can't, well, we'll talk about that in a minute, you can't, you can't convert, you can convert work completely into heat, but you can't convert heat completely into work because it would make, you gotta get things ordered. You can't get all these molecules coming together and you can't do that. Okay, so there's a fundamental difference between heat and work. Um, yeah. It must be stressed that heat and work, Q and W, are not changes in state property. U is a state property. If you fix the state of a system, it has a certain, U is a, a property of the system. One mole of copper at a, you know, has a certain energy relative to anyway, an arbitrary zero. But heat, heat and work are the heat and work that, tra that, uh, that go across the boundary between the system and the surroundings during a process. Now the sum of the heat and the work is equal to the change in internal energy, but the distribution between heat and work can depend, that can depend upon the details of the process, how you get from one state to another. Okay, so Q and W are not properties of the system, they're properties that are transported and that can depend upon the path. Um, and I think I may then just give an example then. Okay, this I didn't write in here because this is to be a summary. Let's take, uh, uh, let's take an example. Of a, this is supposed to be a cylinder. And we'll put a piston in here. Okay. Piston moving up and down in the cylinder. And in here we have a gas. And that's our system. And the gas has a pressure. It has a volume. There's a number of moles of the gas. And the gas is at a certain temperature. And the gas will also have a certain internal energy. Okay, so these are the uh, properties of the state properties of the system, PV, number of moles, temperature, internal energy. Uh, and uh, PV equals nRT is the ideal gas law. Okay, so you all know the ideal gas law. If you uh, 
Uh, keep the number of moles and the temperature constant, you double the pressure, you'll have the volume. If you increase, you all know what the ideal gas law means. Um, okay, so let's suppose the gas is ideal. Let's say we have an ideal gas. This is called an equation of state. An equation of state is an equation relating pressure, volume, and temperature for a system. So any system that has a certain pressure and a certain volume will have an equation of state. There's an equation of state of copper. If you take copper and you put a certain pressure and a certain temperature, it will have a certain volume. Okay. So only two of pressure, volume, and temperature are independent. This is the simplest equation of state. Real gases have <coughs> somewhat more complicated equations of state. Clearly solids and liquids have very complicated equations of state. The equation of state is a PVT relationship. Okay, what are the, uh, when will the gas have this, like on molecular, on the molecular basis, atomic basis, why, when would you expect the gas to obey PV equals nRT? I mean, what kind of gas do you need? Why, why do some gas, why are some gas, when would you expect the gas to be ideal? High temperature, low temperature, high pressure, low pressure, CO2 is more or less ideal than oxygen, what would you expect? And why? What are the assumptions? Kinetic theory of gases. Okay, in an ideal gas, you're assuming that all the molecules are independent. Okay, that they don't interact with each other except by elastic collisions. Two molecules can collide, but they have the same energy and momentum afterwards as before. Now this is not true in a real gas. In a real gas, as the atoms get closer together, there's incipient chemical bonding. There's attractive forces between them. Okay, when two atoms get close together, they try to bond. Or maybe they repel if they get close enough, but there's an incipient ending. So if the atoms are close together, then there's an energy, an attractive repulsive energy between them. And this changes the entire energy of the system. Okay, so therefore the energy of 100 molecules is not 100 times the energy of one molecule. In an ideal gas, if you have one molecule at a certain PVT, the energy of 100 molecules is 100 times the energy of one molecule. Okay, so that is your fundamental assumption of an ideal gas. Now, when do you expect then that to be the case? Okay, so clearly if the gas is very dilute, if the gas has a very low pressure, then the atoms are far apart, the molecules are far apart, so they don't interact very much. So every gas will obey the ideal gas law if, if the pressure is low enough, if it's dilute enough, large enough volume, okay? So, so clearly now also then as you cool the gas down, the gas, the same gas, as you cool the gas down, becomes more dense, simply because it contracts with the, the volume, becomes less. So the same number of molecules, if this gas was at a high temperature, the volume would be quite big. Say I, say I fix the pressure and the temperature. So at high temperature, the molecules are far apart, the uh, gas is more or less ideal, but as I lower the temperature, the volume will get smaller, the molecules get closer together, and you're going to start having deviations from the ideal gas equation. Okay, so you would expect that low temperatures, room temperature, you're going to have more deviation. The gases will be less ideal than they will be at uh, 1,000 degrees. Now, in most of the stuff that you'll be dealing with, uh, Miguel and here, the stuff we're doing, we're dealing with pressure. Well, also then, of course, even at high temperature, if the pressure's high enough, of course, then it'll be non-ideal gases. But for the temperatures and pressures that we're usually dealing with in your work, the deviations from the ideal gas equation are maybe 0.1% or 0.01%, uh, small enough to be ignored within the experimental air limits. Okay. Uh, how about the size of the molecule? Would you expect a gas consisting of long organic molecules to be more or less ideal than a gas consisting of helium? Helium would be more ideal, yeah, because the bigger, the bigger the molecule, the more chances that they can interact with each other. Uh, an inert gas like helium has a very small chance of, of, uh, of interacting with, with this very little bond energy, so helium is going to be ideal even at quite high densities. If you take a gas uh, such as CO2, that's a little bit bigger. No, let's not take CO2 because that's not in draw it right anyway. Let's take a gas H2O. In, in water, gas, your, your electrons, you have electron pairs here and you have some other electrons over here. So you tend to have a, ne a net negative charge at this end of the molecule and you tend to have a net positive charge over here so you have a dipole. 
Okay, so what happens is in the gas molecule, so it's, a, it's an electric dipole, so your another oxygen molecule is going to, a water molecule is going to try to line itself up like this with the negative area of this, negative end of this molecule against the positive end here, and this can be a quite strong attractive force. So polar molecules are less ideal than nonpolar molecules. A molecule like oxygen is not polar, but it does have a quadrupole moment, and that the electrons are more concentrated here, so it tends to be positive to both ends, but kind of more negative in the middle. So we may, in the gas, try to line themselves up this way or something, but that's less, with the quadrupole moment, is less, uh, less, uh, less non-ideal than a, okay. So, I mean, helium will be most ideal, oxygen next, H2O next, and a long, big, long organic molecule will be even less. If you're in organic chemistry and you're dealing with organic material, organic gases, uh, down at fairly room temperature or somewhat above, then you can't possibly use this. You really have to uh, talk about non-ideal gases. And if you take a thermodynamics course in chemical engineering where they're dealing with organic chemistry, a great deal of the course is spent on equations of state, which are not the ideal gas law. In this course, I'm not going to do that, except maybe one of the problems sets to show you the difference. Okay, but generally in this course, you can, even for water in these things at 100 degrees, you might expect to, uh, a deviation of a fraction of a percent. Actually, you can do a calculation with Faxage, uh, treat water, and in Faxage we do have the uh, non-ideal gas equation for H2O vapor, because it's, it's important enough, I mean, H2O vapor, it's inter you know, not around 100 degrees Celsius and so on. So calculate the boiling point of water with uh, Faxage, and it'll come up to 100 degrees Celsius, of course. <coughs> then tell Faxage to do it, but assuming the ideal gas equation, and you'll get 101 degrees. So that's the difference. Just to give you an idea of the order of magnitude. Okay, the non-ideal gas equation for H2O, which is quite non-ideal, at 100 degrees, which is a low temperature, can change in the calculation, the boiling point. Did I say melting point? I mean, boiling point by one degree. Why is the boiling point higher than lower? Water is an unideal gas. The non-ideality raises the boiling point by one degree. No, the non-ideality, sorry, lowers the boiling point by one degree. Okay, so anyway, that's your ideal gas equation. I'm getting sidetracked here, but uh, as I say I'm not trying to do this course rigorously. You've all seen this. I'm trying to get you to think about the uh, things. Actually, let's let's derive. Okay, the temperature then. Have you ever thought about this? Though? what do we mean by temperature? We just assume everybody knows what T is. We say we double the temperature. Uh, you've got twice the pressure, you've got half the pressure of the same volume as a bowl. What, how, but I mean, how do you define temperature? You can't just define it any way you want. You must define, this will only work if the temperature is defined in a certain proper manner. Right? Okay, so let's go to the kinetic theory of gases, which I'm sure you've all looked at. And this would be on number two. All right, so this is the classical kinetic theory of gases. You could say that this is all a bunch of crap because you can't use classical mechanics to talk about particles, and you really can't. You have to do this using quantum mechanics and a particle in a box, but you end up with the same answer. So this is, look at this a bit more as a, uh, a way of looking at it rather than the exact truth. I mean, you can't, this, I'm using classical Newtonian mechanics here, so it's not quite right, but uh, just to give you an idea of what is the, what, what counts. You have one, one particle in a box. So here's your box, and you have one single particle in the box. And what I said is we're going to say later, we're going to try to find out the equation of state for one particle in the box, and then relate that to the equation of 100 particles will simply have 100 times the, the pressure. And the box is a cube, and the length of the sides is L, and the volume is V. The V test is the speed, the particle has a speed of U, and these are the, the components of the speed. So U, X, U, Y, and U, Z are the components in the X, Y, and Z direction. Uh, they are equal, by the way, right? Because, I mean, if they weren't equal, they would very quickly become equal. As the thing bounced around, they would become equal. Especially if you had several... But if, if ux is greater than uy, things would be going this way. They don't have to bounce around. Similarly, if you have many particles, they bounce off each other and everything gets evened out. 
so the force Fx is the force on the, on the uh, walls normal to the x direction. So this thing bounces off the walls and it gives you a force normal to the x direction. And it's the change solved by Newton's law. It's the change in momentum with time, the rate of change in momentum. It's the rate of change in momentum is equal to the force. So this is the change in the uh, momentum per collision with the walls times the number of collisions per second. Okay, so this is the change in momentum. Mux is a change in momentum. Uh, dt, the change in momentum when this thing hits the wall. So it changes completely. So the, uh, you have Mux is the change in momentum. And since it goes Ux this way and then bounces back with Ux this way, the change in momentum is 2 Mux. And Ux over L is the number of collisions per second. That's the time it takes a particle to get from one side to the other. Okay, so this is the change in momentum per collision as it completely changes direction. And this is the number of collisions per second, speed divided by the distance between two collisions with the x wall. The pressure on the x direction is then the force divided by the area. Area in the x direction is, uh, so this is the force divided by the area is mux squared over v. And now we define, let us define uh, temperature this way. K is Boltzmann's constant, a universal constant. Just to get the units right, T is how this is a definition of temperature. So the temperature is the the temperature is equal to the um, kinetic energy, twice the kinetic energy in the x direction divided by K. And that is really how we're defining temperature. Temperature in your ideal gas is that's the kinetic energy, so twice the kinetic energy. Kinetic energy is one half m v x squared. So this is the kinetic energy of the gas in the x direction. Okay. So putting everything together, we get pressure in the x direction is kT over V. That's the pressure, pressure of one particle. The number of particles is the, yeah, there are the number of particles. Oh, come on. The number of particles is n times Avogadro's number. Uh, so we end up with this, and we get PV as nRT, where the ideal gas constant is defined as the Boltzmann's constant times Avogadro's number. Okay, so we're assuming then, basically that's how it comes. This is really your definition of temperature. This is your ideal gas law temperature. Temperature defined according to the ideal gas. Now, why did I only deal with the x direction? Well, because in the y direction it's the same pressure. And in the z direction it's the same pressure. Okay, so you get PV as nRT. You don't have to deal with the three. Right. If you're assuming, however, the most important thing is there's no interaction between the molecules, no chemical interaction except for elastic collisions. No energy is lost or momentum is changed. Now, how about molecules that are rotating? So if a molecule, it's not, not, not a noble gas, it's an oxygen molecule which is rotating. It has energy stored in the rotation motion. So that's going to have more energy than helium has energy just of translation x, y, and z, but oxygen will rotate. Isn't that going to change the gas law? No. It doesn't, because the energy, the energy in the x direction is 1 half mvx squared. The energy, I, I, I could ignore the energy. I, I did this only using the energy of translation in the x direction. Right? I didn't need the y and z direction. Okay, because you go back up here and the energy, the, the velocity in the three directions are going to be the same. The gas will even things out by collisions. Okay, if all the molecules are moving more in the x direction than the y direction, they all end up in one. Okay, now the molecules have rotational energy. So what I can write here is I can write that uh, 1 half m uh, ux squared equals 1 half m uy squared equals 1 half m u z squared, okay, because the three, the energies in the three translational modes, we call them, the three translational modes are equal. But now if the energy, if the molecules are rotating, there's energy stored in a rotational mode as well. But by collisions, okay, this will be the kinetic energy of rotation is also equal to these three kinetic energy. Because supposing there was more energy of rotation, the molecules were rotating really fast but weren't moving very fast they would start to bump into each other and there would be a transfer of energy. 
a molecule is really rotating, whacks this molecule and gets it going, and it slows down its rotation. Okay, or vice versa, the molecules aren't rotating, but I mean now a molecule comes along and whangs this molecule and starts to rotate. So the energy in all the modes is going to be the same. This is called the equipartition of energy. Okay. <coughs> so the gas law stays the same. PV is nRT no matter how many modes you have. But the same thing would be vibrational modes. If you have a molecule like H2O, you can have vibration. You can have vibration um, along the, the bonds. You can have vibration of this kind of thing. Okay, and these, all the modes of energy will have the same energy in them because there's, tra there's collisions will even things up. Okay, so you have the same energy in, in, all, in every mode. Okay, so now if you have a, um, so you end up then, since they're all the same, you end up with the, the same gas constant. But you don't end up with the same heat capacity. Now, if you want to heat up helium, you have to supply energy in these three modes. If you want to heat up helium, you have to supply enough energy, mvx squared, and that gives you the, the ideal gas law. So you want to heat it. If you want to heat a mole of hel helium up to 300 degrees, you have to put in a certain amount of energy to supply the x at mode energy, the y translation, and the z translation. If you want to heat up a mole of uh, oxygen, you have to supply the x energy, the y energy, the z energy, and actually you have two uh, two, you have two rotational modes because you have, just as you have three, um, you have three coordinates and in, in three translational coordinates, x, y, and z. In polar coordinates, when you have a molecule, you actually have two, two polar coordinates, phi and theta. So you can actually store two rotational modes of energy. So what happens here is it turns out, well, we'll show you later, the heat capacity, heat capacity is the energy required to heat the gas by one degree. The heat capacity of helium is three halves RT, the energy uh, <coughs> three halves RT because you have three modes of motion. So this is the heat required to heat the thing. Well, I can probably should write this up. Um, the energy is. Uh, the energy in the x direction is one half m v x squared, which is equal to k t multiplied by the one half k t. Okay, the energy in the x direction of an ideal gas is one half m v x squared. That's the kinetic energy, and that's equal to one half k t. Okay, so d u d t d u d t is the heat capacity. It's the heat required to heat the thing by one degree. The UdV then uh, is equal to three halves k. Three halves k because you have to supply not just the x energy but also the y energy and the z energy. Okay. U is one half kT. Du dt. Du dt is one half kT. It's the same for all the modes. Uh, and if you want, that's per atom. If you want to do it per mole, then you multiply R is equal to k times Avogadro's number. Okay, so du dt is three halves over three halves k per molecule, or the heat capacity is three halves r per mole of gas. Is that reasonably clear? Okay, so in order to heat the gas up, you've got to supply the kinetic energy. The kinetic energy you've got to supply is one half mvx squared to heat the thing up for the, to supply x direction kinetic energy, and that's one half kT. But you have to do it for all three, which are equal to get to heat it up, and they come up in equal in equal quantities. So you have three halves RT. So three halves RT is the heat capacity in joules per degree per mole. Three halves R is the heat capacity of an ideal monatomic gas when there's no interaction whatsoever. And this is in fact what you observe at very high temperatures. At lower temperatures, you it's not quite so high. Now, supposing you're heating up a diatomic gas like oxygen. In the diatomic gas, you have the three, you've got to supply energy to heat it up. So you're heating it up, the molecules are speeding up, but they're also the rotation speeding up. So it's storing energy, not just by movement, but it's storing energy in rotation as well. So it's storing energy in two more modes of rotation. So the heat capacity, ideal heat capacity of a diatomic gas is five halves R. Still has the same ideal gas equation, PV is nRT. Okay, but its heat capacity is five thirds what it was because it's storing energy in different ways. Okay. 
Now, if you have vibration, if you have a water molecule and can, the bonds can vibrate and they can rotate like this, then there's more ways to store energy and the heat capacity gets higher and higher. Okay, so the bigger the molecule, the more different modes of rotation there are, the higher is the uh, heat capacity of the gas. So heat capacities of a big organic molecule are very large because you don't just, you know, the molecules aren't just moving, they're rotating, vibrating, doing all sorts of things. Okay. CO2, CO2 or water will have a higher heat capacity than oxygen, which will have a higher heat capacity than helium. Now this is the ideal gas heat capacity here. Even though most gases obey the PV as NRT pretty well, they don't obey these equations that well because here quantum effects become quite a bit more important. Uh, but I won't get into that. Still, this is the, you can't really expect the gas to have oxygen to have five halves R except at very high temperatures, but you can certainly expect oxygen to have higher than helium and so on. I won't get into the why that, I don't think it's necessary. But if you want to read a kinetic theory of gases. But anyway, the important thing here is the assumptions you're making. The, the molecules are not interacting with each other. And then you get PV as NRT. And the other thing is the definition of T. This is really what we call the ideal gas temperature. And it's basically the energy stored in each mode, or one half the energy st kinetic energy stored in each mode, mode of movement of the ideal gas. That's what it is. So obviously then, looking backwards, I mean, only if you define temperature in this way do you get the ideal gas equations. <laughs> okay, maybe I've got a little bit too much there, but I think it's important too. So is everybody uh, uh, happy with that one? Now, as I say, if you do this quantum mechanically, then you take, the, you take Schrodinger's equation, you start through with your particle in the box, and you write Schrodinger's equation for the particle in the box, and you go through the same sort of that thing, and you still end up with the same, the same equation. <coughs> I'll just okay, finish up what I was doing here, and then we'll take a break. If you remember what I was doing, I'm trying to remember what I was doing too. Get up there. Um, I thought I just got rid of the whole thing. Here then, with the, I said the heat and work. I said although uh, remember I said a system when I got sidetracked. I said a system changing state from state one to state two. Well, this will be the change in internal energy of the system, and that's equal to the energy that crosses the border between the system and the surroundings. And I said although delta du is independent of the path, so you start <coughs> with a system in state one, and you go to a system in state two. Delta U is independent of the path because it's just U2 minus U1. And that's equal to the change in heat plus the change in work. But the heat and work can depend upon the, the way you're going. So I was going to give an example which brings in other things. Let's take this, the system to be an ideal gas in a system, a container, U, P, V, and T. I mean, I'm doing this because I'm sure you've all seen this sort of thing before. It's trying to explain some of the important details. So I'm going to do a pressure, a pressure volume diagram for this. And let's start here with a certain initial state. Now the initial state is given by P. You have a fixed number of, you fix pressure, volume, you have a certain number of moles. Well then the ideal, the equation of state, PV is NRT. So once I say fix a one mole of gas, and I put it, say I put one mole of gas and I fix the pressure and the volume, then it's going to have a certain temperature. Okay, so that will be my initial state. And let's say I go to a final state, which is down here. Okay. Let's say that I do two things. Let's say first of all I keep the temperature constant and I allow the thing to expand. So now what's happening is it's expanding. Let's say, so I'm going to have the system in equilibrium. Okay, so I have an external pressure on top of this piston. The external pressure is being supplied by the atmosphere or you can imagine I put my hand on it. And, and I, the external pressure is going to be equal to the internal pressure or else it's just going to go plop, or if the external is too big, it's going to come irreversibly down. So I'm talking about an irreversible process 
which means the system's at equilibrium internally, but also internally meaning there's no reactions going on, but also it's in equilibrium with its surroundings. So when it's in equilibrium, nothing's happening. Now I decrease P external very little bit and the thing rises. So for all intents and purposes, the external and the internal uh, pressures are the same. <coughs> okay, so the thing expands. As it expands, the pressure goes down and the volume goes up. And I do this, first of all, isothermally, T equals constant, until I get to an intermediate state over here. Right. Now what happens during that expansion? What is the, what is the work of it? Is there, that there's a change in internal energy. Okay. Del du, T equals constant. For an ideal gas is what? Which is an ideal gas. I'm changing, changing the pressure and the volume, keeping the temperature constant, plus the change in internal energy from what you just saw. Zero. Everybody in agreement? Yeah, because the internal energy of an ideal gas depends only on the temperature. Kt is one half mvx squared, okay? And the molecules are independent, remember. They're not interacting with each other. Now the internal energy of, an ide of a non-ideal gas does depend somewhat on the temperature because as the temperature gets lower, the molecules are closer together. Okay, so the pressure, the volume, the temperature in influences the internal energy of a non-ideal gas, not too much, but it does. But in an ideal gas, there's no temperature because the molecules are not interacting with each other. So the temperature is only the energy of the molecules, which depends only on temperature. Right? So delta U is constant. Here I wrote this chapter, I'll be talking about small amounts, dq, dw. Generally we use q and w to integrate, indicate the heat and work, and oh, total heat and work. Integral of dq is q. We don't write delta q, just the notation again, delta u. Delta is used for meaning a, a change. Delta means the final state minus the initial state. Okay, that's when we use delta. Now, we don't write delta Q because it's not really the change from an initial to a final state. It's just the heat that's transferred. Okay, because so writing delta Q can be confusing. If you wrote delta Q, that would mean Q of the final state minus Q of the initial state, but Q is not a property of state. Q is a property. So we just write Q. Okay, or I write DQ if it's a small i. So that's equal to Q plus W, and it's equal to zero. So Q is equal to minus W. Okay, what that means is then if you're going to expand an ideal gas, it's doing work. It's pushing against the external force. Let's make it even clearer. The external force, we've got a weight up here. Where's your weight? Okay. X kilograms. You've got an external weight sitting on top of your piston. The gas expands and lifts the weight up. Okay, so you're doing work. You're keeping the, so the work is now negative. The system's doing work. Work added to the system is positive, so work is negative. And heat then must be positive, so you must add heat to the system. So in other words, if the, ex if the internal energy stays constant, if the internal energy is, is constant during the process, and the and w energy is leaving the system in the form of work, you must be replacing that energy in the form of heat. So the only way to keep the temperature constant is to heat the system. Otherwise, the temperature will drop. Okay. Now, what is the work, then, of expansion? I said I wasn't going to write a lot of the board, and I am, aren't I? But only at the beginning. I will take a break in a minute. Okay, so let's say we're going from... This will be zero. This will be the origin down here. So I'm going to go from state one to let's call this the intermediate state here. Call it state x. State three. We're going from one to three. What is the work if we're going from one to three? We're expanding that. This is going to be an important equation later. So I'm trying to give the fundamental background, but I'm also developing some equations as well. So an ideal gas is going from uh, state one to state three at constant temperature. What is the work done? Okay, the work. The work done by the system is, is minus P external dW is minus P external dV. Is everybody happy with that? The work is uh, P 
work is force times distance, so this thing expands by dx. I don't know, if you think I'm getting too, too trivial here, let me know. But the thing expands by dx and it's applying a certain force. Okay, work is force times distance. It's negative because it's doing the work there. Uh, so we divide that by area, we multiply by area. So force over area is pressure, x times a is volume. A is the area, the a is the surface area of the piston. Okay, so dw is minus e external dv. Okay, this is equal to minus p dv. Okay. If dv is if dv is positive, then the system does work, and the work is negative. Okay. Work leaves the system. This is clearly work because it's directed energy. Uh, so dw is minus p external dv. Why did I write external? Why not the internal pressure p? This is an external pressure here, p external. Okay. External is supplied, or mean of the surroundings, pressures. Because if there was no weight here, then no work would be done. The piston would just go expanding against a vacuum. Uh, this pressure here doesn't matter. It's the work you're doing. Not, no energy would be transferred to the surroundings. So it's the external pressure which is really the work. Okay, so dW is minus X, P external dV. So let's say P external was here. This is P. This is P of the system. P external is here. We have a constant weight out here. So the work done by the system, so W then would be minus, if P external is constant, it would be P external times the change in volume, which would be this area here. <coughs> this is the external pressure, which has to be less than the internal pressure. Otherwise, it would go down. All right? So the integral, this is V, this is the initial volume, and this is the final volume, so P delta V is this area. Correct? Okay, and that would be the, the P external must always be less than the P internal, otherwise it goes the other way, okay? If P external is zero, you're not doing any work. Now, obviously then the work depends upon the external pressure, and you cannot answer the question, what is the work done, unless you know what the external pressure is. But I will give you a limiting case. I will say it's a reversible process, which means the system's at equilibrium, which means P external equals P. So how do I realize this? I take the weight off, I put my hand on there, applying an external pressure equal to the internal pressure, and then as it expands, I release the pressure that the pressure is dropping, but always just so that it moves up very, very slowly. Okay, and now what I get is I get, now I get dW reversible is equal to minus P dV, but now I remove the external. Now it's just P internal, and that's going to be this distance, this area. That's the reversible work. The reverse of the work is P dV. The external force then follows the internal force. And external pressure follows the internal pressure line. And so that's the reversible work of expansion. Okay. And the reversible work of expansion is clearly the maximum work the system can do. Because if there was if the external force ever goes above this line, the thing goes backwards. So what we say is that we say the reversible work is equal to the maximum work that the system can do. However, since work done by the system is negative, I have to actually make this the absolute value. Actually, the reversible work, following the sign convention, the reversible work is the most negative work, or the minimum work. But I mean, So the most work you can get out of the system is when you do it reversibly. Okay, this is a general rule that follows in everything, not just expanding pistons, but all sorts of things. When a process is done reversibly, that's the maximum work you can get out of your system. <coughs> okay, so the, rever the work is the integral of PDV, or minus PDV, is the reversible work. All right, so now we're going to go from here to here, from one to three. So what is the reversible work? So we have here reversible isothermal expansion ideal gas. So what is the work of expansion, reversible isothermal expansion ideal gas? So there are a great many restrictions on this equation that I'm developing. Uh, this is not a general expression for the expansion of anything, or certainly not even a real gas. You have to have 
It has to be isothermal, it has to be reversible, and it has to be an ideal gas. Now it's pretty straightforward. The dW is equal to minus PdV, this is reversible work. So the work then is the integral of PdV from V1 to V2. Uh, it's an ideal gas, so we go from V1 to V2, and for P we put in uh, nRT over V. It's isothermal, so the nRT can go outside, uh, sorry, dV. It's isothermal, so the uh, nRT can go outside the integral sign. Okay, so we get W, the work of it, is minus nRT log of the volume, the initial sec, the sec, well, final volume versus over the initial volume. Okay, so that is that is this area here underneath the curve. Underneath the, this is an isotherm, which is a problem by the way. The equation of the equation of this line is PV equals NRT equals constant. Now V2 is greater than V1, so the work is negative. Now what is the heat that you have to supply? Well, the heat is plus NRT log V2 over V1. That's the heat of that process. <coughs> okay, one last thing then. Suppose that before we take a break, supposing, let's start this again. Right? You're sort of following, I'm going from one, then I'm going back. I was trying to develop something, I develop something on the side, then I come back to that node and I go on. All right, so we got diverted with the ideal gas law, with the kinetic theory of gases, but then we came back to Q and W being path dependent. Then I got uh, onto this. This is a very important form, I'll use that a lot. Uh, by the way, this is equal to the W is minus NRT log V2 over V1. It's also equal to minus nRT log P1 over P2. Okay, if this is V1 and V2, and this is P1 and P2, PV are in inverse relationship because temperature is constant. Uh, okay, so, but I didn't want to go from 1 to 2 to here. I wanted to go, I wanted my final state to be here. Okay, so I'm doing the work now. I start from this state, and I take two steps. I take an isothermal work. Uh, isothermally expanding to the final volume that I'm interested in and then I take a sec this but this is a final volume so I go down to that final volume by this step and what is the work for that step zero okay because there's no change in volume now suppose I go from part point one to point two a different route I take an adiabatic route the route, this route that I showed here was a reversible route, so I did it in two steps. First of all, I kept the temperature constant, so I heat the system, monitoring the temperature to keep it constant. Once I reach the final volume, I then put a stop in here, okay, and then I cool the system, I remove heat, and cool the system at constant volume, because that's what I'm doing here. This is a constant volume cooling, so there's no work done, but there's a heat term. Suppose I go from here to here adiabatically. Adiabatically means Q equals zero. That's the definition of an adiabatic process. So what happens there is I insulate the whole system, and now I permit the thing to expand, doing work, but I don't heat it. No heat change in. So it's still doing work, but now the temperature will constantly drop because it has to get the energy from somewhere. It gets the energy from the internal energy. And so now it's going to follow this path. We'll assume this is an adiabatic path. Okay. Now for this path, for the adiabatic path, which is also reversible, I can still keep the hand on here, this is the work for the adiabatic process. Right? To go from 1 to 2, the work of the adiabatic process is the integral of PdV, so it would be the area under that curve. The area for the two-step process was this total area. So I'm going from the same initial to the same final state, so to go from 1 to 2, Delta U is U2 minus U1, it's independent of the path. Delta U is going to be the same for this path as for this path, but clearly the work is not the same, so hence the heat is not the same. 
and there's any infinite number of paths between those two initial and final states uh, for which Q and W are different, but del du is the same. Okay, so Q just makes the point. And even when the paths are reversible, now if you, if you bring in irreversible paths, and of course it even increases even more, I can go from the same initial to the same final state, making irreversible expansion and get any heat and heat of Q and W I want, really. I can get just about any work term I want, but Q plus W will be constant. Maybe it's driving the point home too much, but I think some of these things are important. Also, I think the understanding of the ideal gas equation, where it comes from, and what the temperature means. Like often we just never ask the question, what does it weigh on the temperature? You know, how do you define temperature? Well, that's the ideal gas temperature, which is the one, well, as I'll show you in an hour, it's not really the temperature scale we use, but it's the same as the temperature scale we use. So, and this equation here is important, but remember when you look at this equation, you're probably going to forget this is only for reversible expansion and isothermal expansion and for an ideal gas. It's certainly not a general equation that applies to anything other than that. Nevertheless, it's very important. Okay. Are there any questions at this point? Because I'll stop now and have a break. How's it going? Okay, wait a minute. What do I do now? I go Welcome down to here. here. No. Let's get rid of that. I want to just go to, I'll go to pause or do you want to go to, you better go to pause. Okay. Can you go to pause? Well, if I go to stop, just then I am, just, just stop. yeah, but then you're going to get more than one file. Every time I stop, I have to give it a file name and you got to put the files together. But you can't pause that? I don't know. I, no, I just stop. Okay, well then we'll give it another file. So where did I go here? Yeah, I went to this. In the corner, I think it's huh? just to, in yeah. the corner, right corner. This one? No. This. Stop. Let's pause. Stop. Okay, you ready? Uh-huh. One, two, three, go.